Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Serge Tomasi. I am the Deputy Director for the Cooperation for Development <laughs> Directory in OECD. And on behalf of the OECD, I would like to welcome you to this consultation on the Green Growth Report dealing with uh, developing countries. Uh, the concept of Green Growth is generating a great diversity of political positions among developed and developing countries, from enthusiastic to cautious, reflecting variously a lack of clarity and experience, differential opportunities apparent to specific countries. We are here today to try to bring some clarity to this debate, <coughs> the analysis, data, and policy lessons we have gathered together in the OECD Green Growth and Developing Countries Preliminary Report. The OECD feels that in order to further the discussions on green growth, we need diagnostics, policy and measurement frameworks to make green, policy, green growth policy a reality, to implement green growth measures and realize sustainable development objectives. We propose elements of a practical policy framework that will help policymakers make the transitions to green growth. But we also need to discuss our approach with representatives from developing countries. I think that the preparatory process of this report is a unique opportunity to deepen the dialogue with the developing countries representatives. So we are here today to assess how useful this report is for policymakers. What did we get right? Where do we still have work to do? A draft of the report as well as a shorter summary for policymakers is available in the room. An outline of the way we propose to structure the discussions is included in the annotated agenda, and we have proposed a series of key questions to which we will welcome your response and insights. Please keep your intervention short and right to the point. We will begin with uh, two short presentations outlining the contents of the report. In a second step, we will have three discussions through the SOF to react and comment. The two speakers will be uh, Hernan O'Claire, Senior Analyst from the Development Cooperation Directorate in OECD, and Steve Bass, the head of the Sustainable Markets Group at the International Institute on Environment and Development. I would like to first give the floor to Hernan for the first presentation. Hernan, you have the floor. Good morning, uh, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Serge. Um, I'm going to talk really about um, why the OECD is doing this, um, and um, um, why we are holding this consultation, and what we'd like to hear from you. And then uh, Steve will present more on the actual content um, uh, of, of the report. I thought perhaps though that I might just um, start off with a, a, a clarification about what the OECD is and perhaps uh, what it isn't. Um, the OECD is a, an inter intergovernmental organization. It's uh, got 34 <coughs> member countries. They're mostly industrialized countries, but not all there are developing country members. Our Secretary General is from Mexico. The latest country to join uh, uh, is, is Chile. It works um, quite a lot as a policy think tank. Its, it's motto is better policies better lives, so it, uh, um, it, it discusses with member governments um, um, their general policy, uh, their policy approaches. It's a forum for collaboration and consensus, so it's to bring governments together uh, to talk uh, about improving policies and to agree on what directions to move in. Its main tools really are evidence, so it does research to gather evidence on the impact and effectiveness of policies, 
and it uses peer reviews, so it gets governments talking to each other uh, and discussing uh, uh, how better to move uh, forward. What it isn't, I think, is uh, it isn't a representative body of its members. So we are not here representing the view of, uh, of uh, OECD uh, member governments. I don't know if there is a view, a single view that OECD uh, member governments have. It's not a standard setting body in any sense or a regulatory body. It's not actually um, uh, setting rules or making rules for its members or anything else. It's not, it's not an arbitrary. Um, over, over so it's very much about um, trying to provide objective, evidence-based policy advice in, in a number of areas. Um, there, are, there are a few people here from the OECD, um, myself and Serge and Shannon and William are from the Development Cooperation Directorate, and our directorate works with the Development Assistance Committee in discussing aid policy and trying to improve the effect of this aid. Dale Andrews, I see here from the Trade and Agricultural Directorate, uh, uh, director which works with uh, people from agriculture and trade policy areas. There's uh, Natalie and Ariana from the Environment, who are uh, directors who work on, on, on the environment. And so, green growth is one of the policy areas, and uh, as you may have heard if you were in the auditorium session earlier on, the OECD um, approved Green, green growth strategy last year uh, called uh, Towards Green Growth. Um, it was very much focused on uh, OECD and emerging economies, uh, in a way, or it's felt to be that, focused on, 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 on countries um, who have a significant, which have a significant carbon footprint and, and mitigation of carbon emissions is a major objective uh, of, of policy. Uh, it, it also it's written for countries that really have significant resources for investment in changing technology and in greening, greening economies, uh, and have sources of innovation, capacity for innovation, both public and private. That's not to say that, for, that developing countries don't have uh, resources of, of, of this nature. Many do, but equally, they have many challenges as well in terms of high levels of poverty uh, uh, and inequality. And the, it's, it's written for countries that have strong possible policy capacity, capacity to formulate, to fund, uh, and, and to deliver policy. And the sorts of recommendations it has really are around, um, uh, are, are around uh, influencing policy, uh, uh, rather influencing prices to price and environmental costs, and using fiscal policy to change uh, private behavior, both producers and, um, uh, and, and consumers. Uh, the idea being basically to tax <coughs> things that are bad for the environment and to incentivize um, uh, the use of uh, production uh, uh, systems and, and livelihoods and consumption patterns which, uh, which are environmentally sustainable. And, and innovation is seen, you know, the idea of green growth of course is that you can achieve environmental sustainability and protect the environment uh, while at the same time sustaining and increasing growth. And the means of doing this is through innovation, the driver of growth is innovation. Uh, and, uh, and, and green jobs. But there was a recognition last year when the, um, when the uh, strategy was, was agreed that its relevance to, to many developing countries, particularly poor and limited to the different uh, contexts uh, that they face. Um, so um, the Ministerial Can Council meeting which approved the report actually mandated us to, uh, to do a report on green growth uh, and developing countries. So to look at green growth in the specific <coughs> context of developing countries and the specific needs of de developing countries. And that was um, very much from two perspectives. One of them was that green growth can only really be achieved globally. It's a global, it's a global project. Achieving green growth in individual national economies will never solve the problem uh, of the global environment and the global environment goods and sustainability and the other idea which was behind it was the context as I said for green growth um, in, in developing countries um, is, is, is very different. Developing countries have um, significant, developing countries really have significant levels of poverty that face the same sort of environmental problems uh, and global environmental challenges that, that developing countries face but they also have particularly 
um, needs and obligations for delivering increased welfare and, um, uh, um, and poverty reduction for their, for their populations. So what is different uh, about developing countries uh, and the context for green growth in them? First thing to say is natural capital um, is greater and is really more important to the economies of developing countries. Uh, it's the source of livelihoods and jobs, especially for poor people. Um, land, water, but also forestries, uh, forestries and fisheries. So, on the one hand, um, clearly, lack of environmental sustainability is a significant problem uh, for developing countries. They will be very negatively affected if their natural capital is, is degraded. But equally, the, 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 the trade-offs are, are different. Know, that the welfare uh, that accrues to people uh, who live in a, 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 a wealth-scarce environment and a high natural capital environment, welfare that accrues to, to improving, in the short term, to improving your natural capital or maintaining it, is probably uh, different from the welfare that, that accrues in, in a country where natural <coughs> capital is scarce and where wealth is high. So the trade-offs are different. Uh, it's very difficult for a developing country uh, that has high levels of rural poverty, not to bring more land into uh, into agricultural uh, production. Um, you might take take the example of, of you know somewhere like Rwanda, where uh, the average uh, farm size is probably around a hectare. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you were to ask a Rwandan, what would, you know, as regards land use, you, know, you, you can feed. Um, feed two families, or two families make their livelihoods on the same amount of land that it would take to, uh, uh, to uh, absorb the emissions, to compensate for the emissions of one family car in Europe. For, for, for the Rwandans, that's kind of a no-brainer question, which would you, which would you choose to do? Um, another significant difference is uh, the large informal sector that most developing countries have in it's large informal economies. You see those figures there. 75% of jobs in Southern Saharan Africa are in the informal economy, and more than two thirds of, of jobs in South and Southeast Asia are informal. Economy. And those are jobs. That isn't talking about people who. Uh, those are paid employment. This isn't talking about uh, people who are, who are making life. Um, and the thing about the informal economy is, is the reach of public policy into the informal economy um, is not so easy. It's not so easy to make policies that have impact in, uh, in the informal economy. Can you imagine trying to tax, for example, the production of charcoal when uh, you know, th there are no factories producing it, there are no shops selling it, the whole, uh, the whole uh, charcoal economy is operating completely, completely informal. So it's quite difficult to do. And, um, so the environment for actually uh, having effective <coughs> public policies uh, that, that, uh, to achieve the, the environmental objectives you wish uh, is, uh, is a bit more is a bit more difficult. And then actually, given the economic structure, the levels of poverty and inequality that countries face, uh, the, the sorts of policies that are required are more complex. We talk a lot about um, reducing uh, reducing incentive uh, subsidies on. Uh, on, on fossil fuels, we know that will have a significant impact on, uh, 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 on poor people. We know also that the vast majority of the, of, of the benefits from subsidies on fossil fuels accrue to people who aren't poor. But you need mechanisms to pr protect the poor people, and that that means that you're, if you're removing fossil fuel subsidies, you need to have social protection or cash transfer or some other mechanisms that target poor people and that will um, mitigate negative impacts. So the more complex policies uh, are required. The other issue I think about developing countries is the political feasibility of green growth. Um, there's a question really, uh, you know, uh, green growth is probably politically more difficult in, 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 developing country, in developing countries. Green growth is often seen as something that delivers benefits globally. Um, that carbon mitigation is something that will benefit uh, primarily uh, developed countries and allow them to continue uh, uh, with high levels of economic growth. But the, the, the costs uh, costs are felt in developed countries, opportunity costs. And it's difficult to talk to, uh, to 
the same. It's difficult for a politician to talk to citizens in developing countries and talk to them about longer term benefits and environmental sustainability and indeed sustainability of economic growth in the longer term when there are very little, uh, when there are short term opportunity costs. People can see economic opportunity which, um, uh, which they cannot uh, avail of. So the economic incentives are critical. Um, perhaps more critical in developing countries than in developing countries. The need to be able to show that green growth will deliver economic growth and will deliver poverty reduction and will do it pretty quickly. Um, that's critical for, really critical for, for um, feasibility in, in developing countries. So, what would green growth look like in, in, in developing countries? I think the first point here is the last one that I just made, which we, you really need to be able to bring the benefits, the economic growth, poverty reduction benefits of greening your economy into the short uh, to medium term. And that, re that means um, specific policies, policies that are designed to do that. So policies really need not only to be focused on the environmental outcomes, they also need to be focused on the economic ones and the social ones. So you need policies that do all of those things. I mean, here in Rio, I know that's not news to anybody, but in, but in, in, in effect, it, it requires different policies and it requires a specific design. So adaptation for resilient life. You, know, if you're going to, you, need, you need these kinds of, some, here are some ideas around the things that will do that. Much stronger focus on adaptation rather than mitigation. So um, delivering resilient life to livelihoods that aren't so susceptible to climate change, to uh, to, uh, to natural disaster and indeed to, to economic risks as well. Uh, that will that in itself ensures sustainability and raises growth and improves uh, uh, poverty reduction. Efficient technologies for reducing costs. The question of energy again, you know, delivering energy access for poor households in remote areas over wide parts of the country. That has a really significant economic benefit to poor people themselves, it reduces their costs, it reduces the labor requirement, it in, improves, the, uh, improves the, the, the local domestic environment. But it requires policy decisions that favor that kind of approach to energy rather than looking at, um, uh, rather than looking at making perhaps the formal grid um, less carbon intensive. It actually requires um, more local level, micro level solutions. And that requires decisions around policies and around investments, where you're putting your money where you're putting your investment. The management and value addition of, of renewable resources. Many renewable resources are overexploited. There are quick wins here. There are cases where it is, it is possible by decreasing, uh, uh, decreasing effort, reducing effort uh, to allow faster reproduction just by uh, reducing effort you can increase production these outcomes um, from, from in, in, in areas like fisheries. There, there are many cases where improved, uh, more intelligent regulation and management uh, from a sustainability perspective actually produces higher incomes, bigger catches. Uh, value addition of renewable resources. So trying to get more, more, in, more linkages into the domestic economy from the renewable uh, resources that you are using and, and and of course, the whole question of over-exploited and under underpriced uh, extractive resources as well. You know, what's going on with, with the, the mineral resources? Very often, the, the tendency is to try and maximize the extraction in order to, uh, to raise le levels of growth, uh, facilitate, uh, perhaps faci over-facilitate investment through tax cuts or whatever. Uh, accelerate your, your extraction without looking at issues about linkages into the rest of the economy. Um, whereas what really needs to be done is, is, is the idea of actually maximizing, on the one hand, the welfare in the economy from it, but also the, trying to capture the rents and using them to build other areas of capital, other areas of physical and human capital, which when those resources are diminished, will continue to sustain the growth um, uh, of, of the Environmental services, ecosystem services, really need to be a, a major sector. Uh, they are an area of comparative advantage of, of countries uh, with high levels of, of natural capital. Uh, like the, um, but the, there needs to be an international trade in environmental services, 
most of the work on, on the payment for ecosystem services at the moment talks about ecosystem services within national economies. But we need, we need an international mechanism for international trade in ecosystem services. Things like carbon trading, uh, but they, they, they need to work better. They need to make the link between the pricing of carbon emissions in developed countries where, where the emissions are produced and the payment for the, for the environmental service, for the ecosystem service in the country which has natural capital to do it. And that link isn't really, uh, isn't really made. That's the example that I gave of Rwanda where, you know, it, it takes the, the, what is available, it, it, it takes the livelihoods of two families to um, provide the land for, uh, to, to mitigate the, or to sequester the emissions from, from one car. So the question of, of building international and national markets uh, for ecosystem services. And the last point I want to make is really about governance. Uh, and this is quite a critical difference between what green growth might look like in developed countries and what it look like in developed countries. Green growth, after all, is, is a process of economic change and transformation. It will involve new, uh, new economic opportunities. Uh, it will involve um, changes in value of important economic assets like land and water and forestry and lots of things. It will mean changes in prices for things like energy. And in those change processes, uh, there are often winners and losers. And generally, the, pe the people who are poorer and who are more excluded from political power, they will be the losers of poverty. Uh, and, and this is a particular issue, I think, in, in, in developing countries. I don't want to go on about governance, but in developed countries, you know, the political settlement is something that is well established. There are trade unions, there are chambers of commerce, the interest groups manage to represent themselves when processes of change go on. And so you can expect to have a process of economic transformation that isn't going to fundamentally undermine or alter the, 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 dis the distribution. But the risks in developing countries we see already the whole question about land. There are risks in developing countries that come from these, these <coughs> kinds of processes. So governance actually needs to be part of, uh, of, of green growth strategies. We can't have green growth strategies unless we have, we have uh, elements in them that look at strengthening governance, making it more inclusive, uh, and, and making it more, uh, uh, more focused um, on the interests and, uh, and the needs so the policies for green growth, they need to focus on equity and distribution issues quite specifically, uh, as, as well as the environment. So this is the last slide. Uh, I just wanted to say that the Green Growth in Developing Countries report, um, we have the, uh, the summary message, uh, sorry, the summary of uh, policy messages from it on, on the left, and this is the consultation draft of the report, which is what uh, uh, what we're here to discuss today. And really, these are the questions that that report is trying uh, to answer. How can greening the development pathways in developing countries, how can it accelerate economic growth and poverty reduction? Uh, and what policy uh, frameworks and instruments are needed and are practical? Um, I think that's one of the things when we, look at, when we look at policies is really to think about things like, do they work in the informal economy? Are they politically feasible? Is there the capacity to design them in the way that they need to be designed uh, and, 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 and to, to deliver them? Um, and then, how can the international community support developing countries uh, to do those things? And that's in terms of, certainly in terms of aid and development cooperation, but also in terms of what's going on in the international governance uh, framework and in, uh, um, uh, and in the um, what we'd like to know from you, really, um, are, are the things that are in this report um, that Steve is going to present now, are these policies, are they relevant to the uh, are, the ones, um, are there other ones that you are aware of that we should think about including? Um, do you have any suggestions for more evidence? Gathering evidence on practical, practical approaches to green growth uh, is... Um, difficult. Uh, there isn't that much experience. There is significant, but there is a huge amount of experience. <coughs> any information you have on, on more evidence of case studies uh, uh, would, be, would be most relevant. Uh, and from your own country experiences, uh, are there any of the things that are in this report, any of the sorts of instruments or 
talked about that you see would be particularly useful in your in your context? And then are there any opportunities for, for collaboration, for a bit of collaborative work uh, on this going forward? And, and, and just the very last point I'd like to make about our report. We talk about policy frameworks and we talk about policy instruments. But we're not asking anybody to buy into some big concept, some big idea of green growth. We're talking about practical things. We want to develop a set of practical policy instruments, tools, which yes, you can put them into a, a big framework if you want, but actually in themselves, individually, they are worthwhile, they can be used in, 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 in So if you bear that in mind when you're contributing. Uh, thanks very much. Can you go on then? Just one comment. In the previous meet, consultative meetings that we have had, I was a bit surprised by the fact that the questions and the comments were more focused on the relevancy of the green economy concept for the developing countries rather than on the effectiveness of green foreign policy. It's my personal opinion, but I am fully convinced that green economy is a key challenge for the developing countries. And perhaps it is more important than for the developed countries. But we are facing some very specific challenges, which that is how we could uh, build some effective green growth policy in the specific context of the developing countries. Uh, for instance, what Hernan uh, said, uh, Regarding the informal economy, the size of informal economy in developing countries, it is a really specific challenge because how we could design some effective regulations, some effective initiatives uh, to impact the informal activities. It is a, a key challenge and a specific challenge for the developing countries. But now I would like to to give the floor to Steve Bass, who will present the policy framework that we would like to, to propose in, in the in the room. Steve, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Serge, and, and, and thanks to Anna for introducing the, the subject, the endeavor. Um, I'm from IID, the, the host of this conference this weekend. Uh, and we were actually delighted to work with the OECD on this. I, I didn't realize at the beginning of my work here that the OECD has such a rich wealth of research and papers on green growth. Of course, all related to OECD countries. So if you look at the OECD website, there's quite a lot of thinking ideas that really work for the OECD. Uh, and what I appreciated was that the OECD wasn't going to then push this whole framework, this whole paradigm on the rest of the world. No, it, it, it recognized that there were some good things to share, but it wanted to take a little bit of a step back and say, well, you know, what is relevant to developing countries? So it worked with IAD and with the Global Green Growth Institute in starting to build the case for green growth more from a developing country perspective. And Again, what I think is good is I believe the OECD uh, has the intention to move from dialogues where we're going to hear from colleagues in developing countries to actually maybe working one or two countries to see uh, what it is relevant to, to share. Um, one of the reasons that IID said yes to the idea of working on this is, is um, we're, we and our developing country partners are always aware that you know, there's always a new fashion from New York or Washington or Geneva and it sort of gets imposed on developing countries and they have to adjust to it and we were really concerned that this should not be the case. In fact, what we were concerned to do was to find in developing countries what people were telling us would be good for green growth and what they have already that can be built on. So, as Anna was saying, a more kind of pragmatic, um, uh, practical way of moving forward. Now, I didn't write this whole report. I only wrote bits of it, but I'm just going to introduce uh, uh, the main framework to you. So, uh, just as I've said, the context is 
we're talking green growth, green economy internationally, but really there's not been yet enough uh, developing country engagement. And therefore, we don't really, we haven't really uh, based uh, this discussion on information on what um, developing countries are concerned about, uh, their ideas, the ideas uh, in the informal economy, the ideas in technology that isn't just um, uh, protected by patents, but that is technology through uh, uh, social movements and so forth. Core information. And the OECD wants to help us <coughs> with offering a platform. This, um, this graph that Serge was showing is built as far as possible on the evidence we've found from developing countries. Uh, literature, case studies, where some of the green growth outcomes, environment, services, uh, industry, governance that includes environmental foundations. Where we're seeing that happening, we've drawn on that evidence from different countries. And we've tried to say, well, why, why has that change come about? Why are you now being able to sell environmental services? So which policy with the green... already been holding dialogues in many developing countries. What does this concept mean to you? Uh, what have you got already that, that fits with this? Uh, what, how should green growth be uh, defined and pursued so that it really works for your country with its environmental assets and, and its uh, livelihood system? So we've been holding these dialogues in eight countries, the developing countries, and we've drawn on what people have told us. <clears throat> We've also drawn on what uh, developing countries were saying about green growth in the process of submitting national uh, uh, statements for this Rio process. Uh, we had a consultation at the Global Green Growth Summit run by the GGGI in May. One or two people were there. Uh, and we need to improve it further, hence today the next step. <clears throat> Initially we were hearing um, when, when we held these dialogues in developing countries, most countries react against the idea initially because they see it as an international uh, idea which is potentially anti-competitive. Eventually, almost every developing country has come around with the idea that uh, our, much of our development is based on environmental assets. We need to secure those assets. We need to value them. We need to explore them. We need to make money out of them. If there, if countries are against anything at the moment, it's the idea that there's a single model. <coughs> Green growth will be driven by individual countries and it will be about choices that families can take, that businesses can take, so that uh, their development paths uh, uh, make more money from environmental assets and yet conserve them in the long run. Uh, the second main view is that, uh, and Ernan's touched on this, it has to lead to short-term improvements in the but uh, in, in the main indicators that people are concerned about, it must need more jobs. It must help contribute to uh, GDP growth. It must contribute to poverty reduction, or it's just playing around the edges. However, the, one of the characteristics that it, that it uh, offers is the idea of build, building resilience in the long term, so that we can deal with climate change, we can deal with resource security. One of the uh, other things I've appreciated about the uh, collaboration with the OECD is that the notion of inclusion has been accepted, I think, by the OECD. Not just green growth, but inclusive green growth. Unless we explicitly include the idea of the growth process improving equity, that idea of green growth will always be held uh, in suspicion. It has to improve equity between nations in terms of their, uh, their rights, their access to resources. It has to improve equity within nations so that it's no longer a case of elites uh, taking control, a sort of green grab approach to green growth. And finally, everyone says sustainable development remains the paradigm. Agenda 21 remains uh, what we want. This is not a new paradigm. Green growth is a means towards achieving sustainable development by getting the economic governance right for sustainable development. That's the sort of views. 
And when we combined the views of what people want, we ended up with a set of, of um, what you could call them outcomes. You could list them as benefits that people should aim policies at. You could generate criteria to screen existing policies or to design policies. But essentially, they're a mix of um, improving uh, uh, economic, environmental, and social benefits in a way that emphasizes people who've been excluded by economies so far being able to become part of the economy to benefit from it, uh, in a way that emphasizes ecological limits and being able to work <coughs> those natural resources harder within ecological limits, uh, in a way that, that, that emphasizes issues of productivity and efficiency. And this, th this set of uh, criteria, benefits, we can use uh, in a way to, as I say, assess what we have currently and design what we have in the future. You can see other initiatives have done something similar. Last night, the Green Economy Coalition presented a set of principles uh, for green economy. They're fairly consistent. All I'm saying here is this is a way to pull together what uh, developing countries in those dialogues and in the literature have been telling us. Having looked at uh, the kinds of outcomes that people describe as green growth, we then ask, well, what, what has helped you to achieve it? Within the machinery of government and business, within your set of policy instruments, what are the kind of best bets that we already have reasonable experience of that can help us take us closer to this set of green growth benefits? A lot of what people have pointed to uh, focus on national budgets, the, 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 the governance of the whole public expenditure process, and the governance of the control of markets, not uh, not giving everything to the market, not treating the market as a devil, but controlling the market. Uh, and others are about creating incentives for investors and households to become greener. I'll just give you a few examples of those that's come up time and again. One is the whole government expenditure review process and the notion of starting to ask when governments review expenditure in all departments, asking some environment, uh, question: What are you spending on environmental assets? What are you? What are the returns to investments in environment? Which of which of your main uh, <coughs> sectors are sensitive to environmental risk? How do we get more money out of environment? Um, there are a few risks in taking a, uh, an expenditure review process, um, particularly uh, if you frame the questions around perhaps the broader set of issues, the, the broader set of green growth benefits than not just, not just environment. One small example, and there are a few others, we noted that when Tanzania added environment questions to uh, its regular public expenditure review process, they, the next year the budget for the environment department went up 500% because they could see that more investment in environment would help health aims, education aims, agriculture aims, and so forth. So that part of machinery of government starting to, to green the questions. This then leads, of course, to the question of uh, green accounting. <coughs> One of the reasons we have continuing ecological damage is that we don't have institutions that value ecosystems. Uh, we don't measure economic performance uh, uh, in terms of the capital we're building and it's changing constitution. We just measure income. And so various green accounting approaches have been developed to deal with this. I won't go into detail. What is really good is that the U UN system of economic and environmental accounting, the framework is agreed. It tends to focus on commercial assets and various others are trying to build into that more invisible sort of valuing the ecosystem service benefits, the flows and losses. And I think the time is right where we have partnerships such as WAVES, the World Bank uh, Facilitated Partnership, Wealth Accounting Evaluation of Ecosystem Services, to help countries begin to start to 
to track that portfolio of capital. Uh, what, of course, we're hearing is that we don't want one approach pushed by, for example, the World Bank. We'd like something that helps us, that maybe step by step, maybe physical accounting first, maybe a sector much more driven by the user. So there's an inexperience here, but what is interesting are some of the members of that partnership who've been through this process uh, are giving confidence to the other members, uh, there are various countries as part of that partnership, to, to say, you know, second best is a good enough step to move forward. One of the other things that people have, governments have been leading on, uh, and others are very interested in, is the notion of sustainable public procurement. Uh, you don't have to wait for the market to change behavior if government, which represents about, you know, over a quarter of, uh, of GDP, or, or there's so many sales of uh, commodities and equipment, if, if government makes a decision to only buy uh, green, um, you've been hearing in this conference here about Brazil's procurement of uh, food for schools and so forth. There are risks of this approach. There's not a great deal of experience. There may not be enough suppliers working on green procurement. It can lead to vested interests coming up and certain monopolies. I've been for some time on the, the UK board for sustainable timber imports for all government uh, buildings and equipment. And it's amazing how that has changed the whole market just by government leading. So that's something that can be a framework part of the framework for green growth, as indeed can the notion of payments for ecosystem services. Um, this doesn't always have to be government-led, it, it very often is through the tax regime, um, society paying for water or biodiversity or so forth. Sometimes it's, it's uh, companies, maybe a, uh, a water bottler or a soft drinks manufacturer paying for watershed services. Um, and there's, there's a lot of experience forming throughout the world. There are rather too many models. There isn't yet a kind of coherent idea of how to run the regime to support a kind of very stable market or government-to-government -government transactions. But here is something that is worth investing more in. If it's voluntary uh, and if payments are conditional so we know we really are getting our ecosystem services. So that's something that else that came up. And there are actually quite a lot more. It's rather a fat book, so I won't go into much more detail. I'm just showing the kinds of um, government mechanisms, policy instruments that, that seem to be perhaps elements of a policy framework. Why is the OECD saying a policy framework might be needed? This isn't a framework so that everything is jammed into something where you must do the A to Z. It's a framework to bring together some of these different initiatives so that we can be, have more focus, more synergies. So for example, um, we really want to get mainstream <coughs> economic policy and the mainstream metrics as part of green growth. And that's, that's in a way the prize that the ministries of finance, heads of corporations, get their mainstream policy um, uh, uh, informed by green growth principles. But we also want to bring into that that experience of sustainable development policy and those metrics too. We don't want just to have one or two huge green growth projects. There's an awful lot of talk, of course, on uh, new clean infrastructure, or clean transport system, wind power. Sometimes the discussion of green growth is entirely dominated by big and expensive infrastructure, which is necessary, but we also need a framework that will accommodate the enabling environment for much more green innovation in many other areas too. And we don't want just a framework for national, we want a framework for the international dimensions because every country has an impact on others, dependence on others, and an, uh, uh, a framework for dealing with public good. So you see what I'm saying here. Short-term growth, yes, but long-term resilience as well. Government policy on green growth, part of the framework, but let's also admit market-based instruments, uh, social enterprise, 
not just a focus on energy that everyone's talking about is highly relevant all over the world, but also stuff that can be particularly relevant in developing countries to do with renewable and non-renewable natural resources. And in the report we have under these different categories, cultivable natural resources, exhaustible, we have some broad policy thrusts that, that developing countries are sort of saying this is where we need to go and, and, and <coughs> summarize some of them. One other reason we need a policy framework for putting all this together is that, um, that in all of this green growth, there are a lot of uncertainties, scientific uncertainties, market uncertainties, and we need to keep track of the achievements from the policies we're putting in place, have a kind of learning approach. Let me just introduce, and I won't go through it in detail, how we've structured this volume. The, the focus is very much on the green growth benefits that I described, the social, environmental, and economic. We then move to talking about the kinds of planning process, the, the plans that you need to, to frame green growth. Some of this is about mainstreaming green growth across existing uh, economic environmental plans. Some of it is about, in some cases, there being the need for an umbrella strategy. We then move into a set of policy instruments that have been proven or seem to be promising, and I've touched on some. Uh, others that I didn't touch on, but I'll just note here, is the key issue of subsidy reform, shifting subsidies from bads to goods, uh, overall tax reform, uh, issues of certification to be able to prove we're getting green and get market uh, incentives for that, processes of innovation. And also noting that there are um, businesses and social enterprises that should be enabled to deliver this. It's not just the government-driven thing. So as well as the policy instruments to deliver specific green growth outcomes in particular sectors, we need within the machinery of government certain mechanisms uh, that can keep continuous improvement going. So, I mean, I think even at this conference here, the notion of councils for sustainable development being established properly in countries, reinvigorated to look at the economy this time, green accounting I've touched on, public expenditure review, strategic environmental assessment, all of these things I've, no I've noted, many developing countries have, they can be better mobilized, better pulled together, I'll just touch on one other thing before I close, and that is this notion of an international dimension. Ernan said essentially that you know if we're going to look at green growth, we have to understand uh, planetary boundaries, social boundaries. We have to look at the, the, the world as a whole, a much more interconnected world. Uh, so in our policy framework, uh, we, at the OECD level, we need to, um, and, uh, and at the national level, understand these planetary boundaries, the impact of one country on another, the notion of enabling trade in environmental goods and services, technology cooperation, and thinking about a global economy. What, uh, uh, addressing the rules of a global economy, understanding now that it, those rule, that economy sits on environmental uh, foundations. So in terms of this international dimension, there may be areas in which developing countries would like uh, assistance. Um, and in this sense, the report also begins to touch on how the community outside individual countries can help. Um, I think the one thing I'd want to emphasize, and it's sort of illustrated in this diagram, is that at the center of any global community assistance to developing countries would be the country's own green growth framework, driven by national stakeholders, based upon the policies and instruments that are in place already, uh, bolstered by areas of the filling the gaps in the areas I've suggested. So the national green growth framework is at the center. Uh, and. Therefore, it begins to be a sort of uh, a set of questions around 
how does aid support this? How does aid understand <coughs> aid which has been based purely on poverty reduction, sometimes on human rights, how does that now um, accommodate the notion of ecological limits and green growth? So how do we strengthen the ODA paradigm? How do we facilitate uh, trade in goods and services? How do we enhance capacities in developing countries to form and implement and monitor the framework? How do we promote green technology? Uh, and how do we ensure that this, sh this shift in aid towards green growth is coherent with the rest of OECD policy? Now, I don't suspect everybody's read this draft, and I'll just give you a little bit of a flavor of what is in it. This, in a sense, repeats what, what Diana has already said. We've drawn on some evidence, but there is not a huge amount. If you look at the literature on green growth in developing countries, a lot of it is about aspirations and ideas and hopes. We'd be very interested to hear good cases of green growth at the sector level, at the national level, that you think we can learn from and share with developing countries. We also would like some ideas on the broad areas of recommendations that, that, uh, that we've touched on. Are these kinds of uh, elements of the framework the sort of thing that, that you feel is important? Machinery of government, expenditure reviews, strategic environmental assessment, and some of the kind of policy <coughs> instruments that we've listed in the report. And then the final question is about communication. I mean, this has sort of been done in, a, in an office, uh, drawing on results from quick dialogues in developing countries, and now we've had a couple of sessions like this. Where should we go next in order to, to really start to make a difference? In particular countries who have the opportunity, maybe it's in a national plan reform process, a PRSP reform, where is there a real opportunity to help particular countries make the next step, understand the foundations they have, and make the next step? So these are the sorts of things we might wish to discuss. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I should say. Thank you, Steve, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation of the framework. I would like just to highlight one point, it is uh, discussions around the inclusive character of green growth. Uh, because it was uh, so uh, difficult um, discussions at the beginning of the work done by the G20 Development Working Group regarding green growth. And uh, you know that in OECD, um, the Secretary General is very committed to request some new ideas regarding economic policy. And we think that inclusion, social inclusion, is a key challenge that we have to address now. Because if you look at the global economic model, currently, both in developed and developing countries, it is generating more and more social inequalities. And it left outside an increasing number of people. So the questions of the inclusive green growth model is a key issue for us. And we feel that in both has to deal with poverty and relegation. But the challenge is how to build an effective, inclusive, green growth economy. Now I would like to invite the discussions uh, with another Serge, Sergio Margulis, and um, Kevin Chica Urama to take the floor and to uh, provide the initial remarks on, on the report. Uh, these comments will uh, stimulate uh, an active discussion. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Sergio Margulis, who is a former president of the Environmental Agency of Rio de Janeiro State. He also worked for 22 years at the World Bank in various areas of environmental management. Sergio, you do have the floor. Hello. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, OECD colleagues, for the invitation. And welcome all of you here to Rio, Brazil, etc. Um, I have been a long uh, uh, friend of the OECD, and I've been 
for under various hats in working with you and to comment a paper uh, of this nature is always an extremely hard job because the OECD is a reference on environmental economics issues uh, since at least uh, the last, uh, for at least almost 30 years since I started to work on environmental economics. However, uh, because of this uh, friendship and I feel at ease with you colleagues of the OECD, I must, uh, it's not because I have a different hat now, government hat, but I am extraordinarily, I would be extraordinarily cautious with this report. I must be very frank, uh, and I'll be blunt on my comments. Um, I, and, uh, and the reasons, and I, before I go into why I'm very concerned, I also must say it is great to uh, have a session and a report which is printed with the name consultation draft. So you, if you allow me, I will probably need 10 minutes uh, to, I will go over my time to discuss uh, real issues that I have, I think we have uh, problems with. But we appreciate very much the opportunity to make our comments. So I'll start with, well let, let me start with uh, the main, one of the main issues, which is the what you, Mr. Chair, referred to as the, 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 the inclusion part. And my frank reading of the report, which is very similar to the same thing with the World Bank report, is that the inclusion part is as if it was an, ad, uh, an added on item. It is absolutely not at all mainstream in the document. So my take, if you are writing about green growth in developing countries, my starting <coughs> point for this report is, which is obvious I think, is developing countries need to grow tremendously. They need economic growth they need to raise income levels. They need to urbanize. And this requires enormous effort. Now, given this need, these needs, how are we going to adjust both our own economies in the North and in developing countries to achieve these objectives, which are legitimate objectives and which will not be reversed. Now that's the starting point. Together with the need to better distribute and all the issues of development. Capacity development, institutions, governance, blah, blah. So that's the starting point. The report is silent on this. It goes straight into pretty standard prescriptions of environmental economics, which are, must be frank, again, it's exactly the same as in 1992. So, the social challenge, uh, it would be great to hear from you see some insights on these things, and taking as a starting point the fact that the only way to go green, or even non-green, is to take the need and urgency to grow as a starting point. Now, the second fundamental point is the distinction between when you put in a basket natural resources and green growth, when you put carbon with the other natural resources, you are just adding up a lot of confusion. Both technical but fundamentally political. Why do I say this? Because on the natural resources, water, forests, biodiversity, institutions, policy frameworks. The OECD has always been our, one of our leaders. I mean, we've always been looking at the OECD models and trying to replicate and learn from your lessons. And you have enormous uh, amounts of experience to teach to us. And we've been trying to follow this. So, so water resources management, you know, the French basin systems, and all of these uh, experiences from the OECD. Carbon is a completely different story. 
and I will really allow myself to make a, uh, uh, I'll mention something which I was uh, a, a commentator a couple of days ago on an event, and our sweet colleague from Sweden, uh, uh, she came from a development institute, I'm sorry I forget the name, but she made a comment, with, you know, she was talking about uh, Sweden's advancements, you know, that the country is really put, pushing itself to uh, zero emissions in 2050. So in 2050, Sweden will emit zero carbon uh, by law. And in 2020, the vehicles will have this, and the industries this and that, etc. And the heating, this year, heating city, the districts, etc. And then, you know, she says, okay, Sweden is making all this enormous effort, but then we question ourselves whether Sweden is going to be a green island in a brown ocean. And I said, uh, Ms. Eva, I, I, I'm really sorry, but this is not the issue from our perspective. My understanding of Sweden is so small. What Sweden needs to do is to green the ocean. The ocean cannot be brown. It doesn't make any difference if Sweden is going to be zero emissions. The ocean cannot be brown. It's one planet only. If the OECD countries go to zero emissions and China builds one thermal power plant carbon fed every week, which is what it does now, 50 thermal power plants per year, <laughs> what difference does it make if Norway is zero emissions? I mean, it's important, but now, so what, what am I saying here? What I'm saying here is that the OECD in carbon cannot even, it, it cannot preach anything to developing countries. It's a different ball game. The game here is we are on the same boat. There is nothing to, we, are, we all have to fight together under the same envelope. No point Norway going on its own without China. On water resources, China, Brazil, Indonesia, Rwanda, we all want to learn from OECD how to manage water resources, because you have the experience. But on carbon, it's a different ball game. In the report, it's all mixed. So we're talking about the global externalities together with the national externalities. That doesn't help clarify what is the green economy. It's a completely different ballgame. Uh, the principles of green growth, which the report refers to, they, are, they have been agreed in 1992. That's, it's common sense. Nobody here will dispute any of the recommendations of the report about the need to mainstream the environment, about capacity development, about governance. Fine. The issue is, of course, how we do it. So also, the report just saying again that we need to mainstream the environment, it's even counterproductive because you say, well, we haven't done this in the last 20 years, what would make us mainstream now? Well, because we have a crisis. Now it's more evident that the crisis is here. Not only the climate crisis, but also the crisis of the affinity of natural resources. Well, do we only move by crisis? I guess, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. we only move by crisis. We know this. Okay, but then let's acknowledge this. So don't phrase, you know, let's mainstream, you know, because it just didn't work. We can say now, okay, because we are very pressed, okay, then it, we may mainstream now. A couple of comments on chapters. Chapter two, you refer all the, I mean, you, you mostly discuss CO2 per capita. This is a non-starter. We have to talk about CO2 per dollar generated, and then we talk about distribution. But we are all looking for efficiency here, and it's, uh, Ton per carbon per dollar generated. Doesn't matter where it goes from. And then we think about distribution because the per capita is a non start. We're always going to be favoring uh, China's construction of 50 power plants per year. Uh, the chapter three, uh, you know, it's the most dense, but it's the most more of the same. I mean, it's good policy prescriptions, let's cut subsidies, uh, payment for environmental services, innovation, etc. Fine. We all agree, we all know, we all. Completely supportive, and the OECD has always been a, the leading think tank on this, so we completely <laughs> endorse everything in Chapter 3. The Chapter 4, which is on the international cooperation, you know, the international agreements, funding for the first steps, and the trade technology, etc. Uh, I have an issue here. I mean, this is where we, I started to feel uncomfortable about the, 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 the inclusiveness. 
is that um, it, it, it's the issue that you don't refer to is the competition for resources. For a country like Brazil, um, uh, the, the, if you ask any Brazilian, what is the first thing, I give you $10,000, uh, the marginal increase of uh, the government budget, where are you going to put it? Health, no question on it. Every Brazilian is feeling in our health system is collapsing. But the next is education. It's also not going well. What do we care about? Well, we care about the global. So is there such a thing as conditional uh, aid? Can, can we talk about it? So address it heads on. You know, uh, is this an issue? You know, we're going to put money, we're going to help, but it is for, uh, you know, improving uh, management of carbon or other natural resources. But let's be explicit about this, talk about this, because otherwise it's a bit illogic. You know, the, the, the government is maximizing welfare, so it's allocating any additional uh, budget support in to improve welfare. The, gov the money comes in, well, I'm not going to put, I'm sorry, controlling emissions, I'm going to put in an improving health system. That's what the country wants. The, on chapter 5, you talk about green protectionism. I, I'm not sure I'm against green protectionism. Is, is this a problem? I mean, or should we be scared or concerned about it? I mean, frankly, uh, you know, it, we are all against child labor. We are all against slave work. We are all against discrimination against women, etc. And if a, you know, if a country is eventually discriminated for these uh, acts, we, we don't think it's wrong. So why would it be wrong to, you know, put barriers to countries that are ripping off their, you know, the global natural resources? Why not? I mean, we don't want this. We really want to sanction. Okay, fair enough. There are other political readings here, but, you know, let's not just say, oh, no, 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 we're never going to touch on the, the trade issues. We are and we want. Plus, not only we want, but the consumers will want. The consumers sooner or later in Germany are going to say, well, we don't want steel uh, coming from Brazil, coming from un uh, unsustainable forest management. And they'll say, we don't want this kind of steel. We don't want this kind of fruits. We don't want this kind of cotton. These clothes, these shoes produced by children in China. We don't want these things. And so, okay, let's put it on. It's going to come anyway. So it's not a matter of we want or not. The markets probably want to do this. Um, last uh, point is... Yeah, maybe so the report suggestion is to say a little more about the consumers in both developed and developing countries. As a globalized system, you know, the consumption side is a bit uh, disregarded here. And lastly is the last chapter. Uh, uh, you are, as I said, the world reference on uh, indicators, valuation on the micro side, microeconomics. So you talk about a lot about you know, the need to value these things, to monitor, to measure, you know, the, 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 the quantification. And we completely endorse, but you do not uh, mention enough the, the something which is every panel I go to, this real plus is the need to enlarge the concept of the GDP. I don't like it. I, in, okay, the GDP is an excellent uh, indicator for value-added. That's what it measures. Nobody, no economist ever said this is a good measurement of welfare. Oh, economists know this even better than non-economists. Okay, fine. But, oh, but people use GDP to measure wealth. No, economists don't do this. We can do this as a proxy. But everybody's talking about the need for macro indicator that incorporates that. And I close my remark by saying, well, tomorrow uh, we, Minister of Environment, Minister of Finance, Brazil, World Bank Conservation International. We are promoting tomorrow a, a full, uh, an all-afternoon event on uh, national green accounts. So it is the national accounts incorporating environmental issues. So it is bringing the other dimension, which you beyond. I mean, you mentioned in the report, but I would, you know, we need to perhaps strengthen a bit and talk about the need to do more inclusive uh, welfare indicators or national indicators beyond GDP. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, for these very challenging questions. Um, I think that Caroline and Steve will try to reply. But now I would like to give the floor to Kevin Shikia Urama, who is the executive director 
of the African Technology Policy Studies Network and the President of the African Society for Ecological Economics. Kevin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's very challenging for me to now make further comments after the very rich and uh, uh, comprehensive um, X-ray of the whole report, both in its spirit and in its content. Um, I'm not going to repeat some of the things that has been said by my fellow commentator, to which I agree, um, in many cases, like the issues of inclusion. But then I have to add that what we're seeing now is actually an improvement of the process that we have been seeing uh, in, the, in the past. Um, I think this is the, the first time we're having the OECD actually come up with a draft report and make proactive effort to engage with developing countries in order to enrich the contents of that. So on that, I would like to really congratulate the OECD for trying to do that. But then, in the content of the report itself, the inclusiveness issue, <coughs> the issue of social equity, the issue of distribution of resources, which has remained the, the main issue within our sustainability debate from the context of the developing countries, is still very weak and could be strengthened a little bit more. But that does not underscore, um, I mean, undermine the overall benefits of green growth, which the report clearly articulates in terms of providing opportunities for green employment, uh, internalization of externalities, and it claims also that it wants uh, equity and inclusion within the growth process and systemic, systematic adjustments between the economic, the environmental policies and institutions for mainstreaming all these environmental economic principles, which I fully also agree since 1992 has been there, but has not been fully implemented. So providing a report that gives a reminder of these things might not be generally bad. I think it's good to do that. But more fundamental in my own comment is the thinking on the continued focus on GDP. Because that shapes also the logic um, and the whole content of the whole report in terms of from which disciplinary domains does it draw in the analysis that it <coughs> provides. And using that GDP as a measure of economic pro uh, progress, and for many people also, badly using it as a measure of human prosperity, uh, is a major issue that we need to also address. Because from the African perspective, there is that continued um, realization that GDP is limited and does need an alternative metric that can be used for comparison of countries. And this is coming from the recent macroeconomic environment within Africa and most developing countries. Uh, in the report, it also identifies the fact that in the past decade, the non-OECD countries has outperformed for the first time uh, the OECD countries in terms of GDP growth. And then the question begins to come for most policymakers in, in, in Africa and most other developing countries, why change the metric now? Why change the direction now? It's like we're catching up and things, we're now beginning to change the whole dialogue again. So that, even though I don't fully agree with that because uh, green growth provides a lot of opportunities as have been shown in the report, <coughs> that's a perception amongst policymakers and stakeholders that needs to be dealt with. And if this report can actually go a step further to try to discuss the other main, other uh, metrics for measuring progress instead of focusing on the GDP, then it will add value to its accessibility and ownership within the conti uh, continent. Now, some of the challenges that I see in the adoption of uh, uh, green growth, some of them are clearly articulated in the report, but also not dealt with in terms of how to address those challenges, like the issues of the differences in context and trade-offs. We cannot continue to discuss green growth for developing countries while we know that actually the non-green growth we have is from the developed countries. Most, um, if you use carbon, the emissions from the developing countries still remain very low and many policymakers and even economists and uh, climate scientists in Africa would argue that the whole of the African economy is green because it's actually not polluting enough. So that's trying to actually address 
green growth in developing countries without bringing the issues of green growth in the developed uh, countries. Given that we all have one, uh, one planet, is a very challenging concept that, uh, in, on how to deal with. Now, in the report again, there's the issues of uh, higher upfront costs for mainstreaming green growth, and also clearly articulated in the presentation. But it doesn't deal with how these uh, the higher upfront low-hanging fruits in terms of benefits uh, to the developing countries uh, in adopting green growth. It hasn't really ad uh, addressed it so much in detail. And then another question then will be dealing with the growing concept of green capitalism. Now, green capitalism in the sense that all the tools, the policy uh, measures that we have in this report are all normal policy measures that you normally have in trying to mainstream environmental externalities in economic, uh, mainstream economic planning. And then the question then is, how will this be different from the continued practice since 1992? And I think it came up in this discussion that, that has been there. So dealing with that is also another issue. And what I have discussed here are mainly perception issues, which are actually very strong within the developing world. And I think from the comments we have had, we can see it's very strong. So how the report can improve in addressing these perceptions and uh, will be very useful. Also, what I see missing in terms of the policy tools is on how to change behaviors and mindsets, especially with regard to consumption in the, global, in the global north, and also changing the behaviors and mindsets in terms of consumption of the global south in uh, uh, taking a different trajectory, not imitating the, the global north. Because the, the, the objective function in the global south seem to be to do what is being done there because more growth is good. But the question is, is more GDP really always good? Is there an optimal size that GDP growth reaches and then we, we need to stop? There have been some studies of gross domestic happiness and so on that can be drawn on in order to actually try to deal with what level of growth can be green and what level of growth can necessarily not be green. The issues of skill gaps and knowledge gaps in the developing countries seem to be addressed in the sense of, hey, we can help you do it. And that leads me to the other issues about the policy instruments and that was uh, talked about, innovation. How can we really make the innovation framework to work for sustainability? That, that needs to be inclusive and not the general principles of technology transfer, knowledge transfer that has dominated previous debates, because a lot of the studies within that area do actually show that that doesn't benefit poverty alleviation, neither does it also lead to inclusive growth or distribution of wealth. So we need to try and see how to deal with this issue. Rightly, the report also talks about one size does not fit all. There's no prescription for what green growth either means for countries or even how it will be implemented. So the big challenge then is how to have a green growth framework when there are different perceptions on what is actually green and how the greening should be done. So that is something that needs to be strengthened in, 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 uh, in, in the report. Now, perhaps the most daunting challenge for the report is promoting sustainable development. I know it said here, it's a means of achieving sustainable development. Yes, if we're able to internalize the externalities, we'll be taking a step forward. But a lot of studies do show within the climate realm that even if we did all those and gained all the efficiencies, we still have a problem. So there must be more transformative changes that needs to be done uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 the objective function. Are we greening the growth or actually greening our behavior? That is another question that keeps coming up and we need to try and deal with it there. Making sustainability, uh, making innovations work for sustainable development. I've also already mentioned the issue of trying to expand on GDP as a metric of pro progress. That's a very good metric, but it's not inclusive. And the greening, if we're focusing on GDP, raises a question, can GDP really be green? That's a question that others have also been asking. Now, we also need to think about mobilizing ownership and political will. Because of the history of development paradigms, 
developed mainly by the better world institutions, you put it very right, and then set down the truth of the developing countries, like structural adjustment program and so on. It is very crucial that we try and ensure, continue this process of um, consultation and uh, negotiations to ensure that this report is owned by the developing countries. Because otherwise, perception also can lead to um, resistance on, on, on this particular report. Political will is a big elephant in the room, and how to be able to mobilize that is something that needs to be followed on in, uh, in, in, in this particular issue. And this is also one thing that I personally feel very passionate about. Can the private sector lead the way without actually focusing on working with governments and governments all the time, trying to reach global agreements that never really um, happens? Um, that would be very useful in terms of strengthening the role of the private sector, especially in the informal economies, to mainstream green growth in the developing countries. And that will be my last word, that we also need to think about transitioning from green growth to greening societies, greening behavior, greening consumption. All these things are much more important than greening uh, GDP because this dialogue can also lead to loss in environmental stewardship, which is strong in many developing countries, because it will turn the attention to how much can I get for preserving the environment, rather than preserving the environment as my culture. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sergio, because we received a letter very uh, challenging questions. Um, thank you uh, for raising these questions. Um, some are dealing with the economic dimension, how to create more jobs and to support economic growth in developing countries. Some are dealing with social dimension, uh, how to deal with property eradication, and how to improve social equity. Some are dealing with how to address um, carbon emission in a global world and in, uh, with, uh, as you said, one planet. Some are dealing with international cooperations, how to deal with green protectionism, how to deal with the question of the conditionality for ODA. Some are dealing with um, uh, how to misuse the progress. I think you, you are right. It is a really important uh, issue. We have a, a problem of timing because um, we have Peter Nor from the Norwegian Corporation who should take the floor during the lunch, but he has to, to leave very quickly, I think. Yes. Uh, as you address the question of international cooperation, my proposal would be to give right away the, the floor to Peter Nor. Uh, he will present uh, an example of cooperation in Ghana, I think. Yes. And after that, we could open the floor to the room to react and to comment both the presentations and the first round of questions raised by uh, Kevin and, and Sergio. <coughs> and after that, we could have the lunch and to give the, the floor to uh, Moz Rogema from Rwanda. P Peter, are you ready to take the floor? Yes. Um, I, I was meant to be here with a Ghanaian, uh, a representative from Ghana. Has anybody, has anybody raised a hand here? <laughs> no, I can be Ghanaian. You can be Ghanaian. <laughs> well, <coughs> you are from Ghana. No, no I, I am from planet Earth, but I can speak for Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I, there was a little bit of uncertainty about whether they would be here. But then, can you click for me? Um, I'm going to talk about something that uh, very few people in this conference actually are addressing, and that is oil and gas. I counted uh, how many interventions there were in the whole Rio plus 20 considering oil and gas, and I counted two. Okay? This being one, and then no, three altogether with this one. 
The reason why I want to tell you that this is important is simply if you look at this graph. It's from the IEA. What does it say? Well, it says that even in a two degree world, fossil fuels will constitute almost 70% of world primary energy demand. You all know the IEA scenarios. And uh, the two degree scenario is the green one. So you see, if you add up coal, oil, and gas, you come to almost 70% of world energy coming from fossil fuels. Uh, I will not say anything about coal. Uh, I will say something about oil and gas, and I'll say something if you, th if you have the next one. I will say something within the context of an initiative called Oil for Development. Oil for Development, I will come back to a description of what this is, but what it deals with on an operative level is it's linked very clearly to the question of sustainability. So this is not something that is, aside from our main discussion, in my view, dealing with oil and gas should be an integral part of what we are talking about. It cannot be that the world community is simply saying, this is so dirty, we don't want to have anything to do with it. This is not the way to deal with this. Actually, the question is, how do you actually get sustainable development within the oil and gas industry. This is not the contradiction in terms per se, because you can produce oil and gas in the most terrible ways. You all know about the resource curse. You all know that you can develop oil and gas to the benefit <coughs> of global sustainable development, and you can do the absolute opposite. And then Norway happens to have certain skills experience history that makes it more interesting for us to share that experience and maybe push the direction of how the oil and gas world is moving in a somewhat more sustainable manner. I'm not saying that this will save the world. It's not going to, to actually in itself be a solution, but it's not simply as if we're talking about the deck chairs on the Titanic. It is more complicated than that. So it's well worth actually addressing this issue, and that is why I'm going to talk about this. Very short, the Oil for Development program is assistance to developing countries upon their request, very important, in their effort to manage petroleum resources. That's number one. Next one, it was initiated in 2005, and one of the persons who started that is in the room today, Paul Engbert Pedersen who was then director of NORAD and who has been part of creating this animal. So he must take a little bit of the responsibility. No, he doesn't, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I was running this program for three years while he was the director of NORAD. It's based on Norwegian experience and expertise and then goes straight into the whole discussion about what can donor countries do, what should they do, where do they have a comparative advantage, and Norway happens to have a comparative advantage in this particular area, on a global. I mean, there are things that we don't really know very much about, but there are other things that we do know something about. This is being one of them, and we are actually using that expertise to actually address the issues that we are talking about. About 20 countries are partner countries, core countries, and countries with limited cooperation, but 20 countries there have been about 50 countries that have asked us for help. And you all know the developing, you all know this game. You also know that it's extremely unusual where 50 governments knock on your door saying, can you help us to solve this problem? Here we just simply had some examples that we just went through about how it's difficult to connect to actually get an understanding among developing countries about what we are talking about, all of these kind of things. Suddenly, here you have something where somebody is rushing down your door. All you can say is you have to put up a sign saying, sorry, we have run out of capacity. 20 countries is actually far too much already. Anyway, next one. The budget is about $50 million a year. 
And here you see how it has increased. It has almost increased sixfold over the last five years. So this is an expression that Norway is actually putting a lot of money, a lot of resources into this. At the moment, we have about 100 man years dedicated to this particular area. So by Norwegian standards, that's a big thing. Partner countries of 2011. Next one, please. Here are the main, main countries, Mozambique, Angola, Ghana, Sudan, North and South, Uganda, Timor-Leste, and Bolivia. And then Tanzania will come soon. And you all know what is happening on the African continent in terms of development of energy. There are huge gas fines being made both in East Africa and in West Africa that are changing the whole parameters of the energy system on these parts of Africa. And uh, we will address that together with the Tanzanian. So Tanzania will come as one of the core countries in addition to this. And then underneath, you see a number of con other countries of smaller importance as far as effort is concerned, everything from Cuba to the Palestinian territory to Tanzania has been in that category, it will be moved into the main category, and Lebanon, just to take some of them. Next one, please. What are the key features of this program? It's demand-driven. As I said, nobody is trying to sell an idea to the developing countries that are in this program. They come and demand support insights from Norway. As I said, that's quite an unusual situation to be in. It has a long-term perspective. All the evaluations we have done show that if you are serious, you have to be in a country for 10 years plus, if not 20, but let's say 10 years. You have, it takes 10 years to change institutions, to build capacity, especially in a business like this. The Brazilians among you know about what happened over time in building Petrobras. I'm not saying that these countries should have the Petrobras's, but all I'm saying is that if you look at your own experience, it has taken a long, long time to build that capacity in order to make the Brazilian state an equal part with the international companies and building your own state company. Norway focuses on the area and the countries where we can make a difference, as I said. <coughs> we do not export the Norwegian model. We share experiences with countries. And we are, in many ways, a dialogue partner. What are the core activities that we deal with? The first one is create a legal and policy framework. You have to have a framework. If you are a poor <coughs> developing country you, and you are found oil and gas and you basically are going to negotiate with the greatest and most powerful companies in the whole world, you're going to build a position in one of the most complicated industries on earth. What do you have to do? You have to have some kind of policy framework. You have to have some kind of legal and regulatory framework. So that's number one. That's you have to have. Number two, all of these beautiful, fine, nice legal structures, policies come to nothing. And I say they come to nothing unless you have people in the local <coughs> state apparatuses that actually are capable of carrying out these policies. So you have to have a skilled state that actually is very important in this area. You have to, again, take time to build capacity, to get people in, to train them. Without that, the first part is just empty. So both of these things have to hang together. That's number two. Number three, you have to strengthen the watchdogs because these states are not like beautiful, nicely run social democratic states like <laughs> the Norwegians. They are corrupt. They are in many ways inefficient, patriotism, you name it. So the only way to actually also deal with this situation 
is to build civil society, to build independent power, to actually counterbalance a state, because you have to have a state to negotiate with the companies, to run the business, but that state has to be under some kind of democratic control. Civil society, independent press, parliamentary, the parliamentarians that actually stand up and get counted. Anybody who has run, seen what has happened in Uganda lately, knows that there, the parliament, the parliamentary committees have actually just kicked out three uh, ministers for corruption. They want to scrutinize all their, their contracts, etc. And that is one part of the kind of um, counterbalance that we are talking about. So that's what I mean by strength. So oil for development works along a resource bit, environmental bit, and it works on a financial pillar. I will not go into big discussions about this, but the first one is really getting the most out of your resources. What does this have to do with sustainability? Well, it means that of the 70% of the world's energy, you waste as little as possible, you have the greatest kind of uh, extraction rate, and this sounds boring and not very sort of sexy within the kind of traditional framework that we work about, but it's damn important from a global taking care of your resources. This resource management deals also with the whole legal and regulatory <coughs> framework, it deals with local content, it deals with uh, those kind of issues. Number two is environmental uh, management, which has to do with how do you produce oil and gas in the most efficient and environmentally conscious way. Some people say, come on, this is dirty, we don't want to know anything about it. That, I feel, is an absolutely wrong way to do this and to think about it. You have to be sure that the way that you produce the oil and gas, which is 70% of the global energy mix, is done in the most best way possible. There is a, a difference between one to two of the most efficient and the least efficient way of producing oil and gas when you look at it in terms of uh, environmental emissions, etc. And then the third one has to do with money. Okay? How do you make money? How do you make a country live with an income stream that goes up and down? You don't go and spend all the money when you get high prices and then suddenly behave like a drunk sailor. And then actually, this is an extremely important thing. People, their ministries of finance, ministries of economies, have to somehow deal with that. People come to Norway because we have an oil fund. That's kind of ridiculous because if you start as a small African state, maybe you have an oil fund in 30 years time. And it took 30 years for Norway to build its own oil fund. But that apart, this is an issue that is worth looking at. And what goes all through is good governance. You have to have good governance going through these three pillars. Now, let's go to Ghana. As an example, OK? This was the overall framework. I feel that this is an important and interesting way of actually dealing with sustainability issues. It's not the normal way. It's not what everybody is talking about, but it's well worth addressing. Let's take Ghana as an example. In 2007, Ghana found a big offshore oil field called the Jubilee Field. Big by any standards. They came to Norway and said, please, can you help us with this? This is a new challenge, and today, you look at Mozambique, they are in exactly the same situation. You look at the West African countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, they are all starting to find oil and gas. <coughs> in order for this to actually not to be a curse, but actually a blessing for a country, you actually have to take care of it. So they came to us and said, could you please help us? Yes, and we, we had a five-year MOU in 2008 to develop a policy framework starting and most importantly, the president said to us, hey, I need help to do one thing. I need to get people's expectations right. Because people, when they think they have oil, 
two years later they all expect to be floating around in gold and get lots of income. This takes 10, 15 years to mature. So part of the upfront thing is not only to create policies, but to actually have a dialogue with your own people <coughs> to actually say, hey guys, this is going to take a long time. Um, in 2010, <coughs> Norway and Ghana actually signed two five-year contracts on environmental issues and on resource management issues. We haven't signed anything on the financial issues because simply Norway doesn't have enough <coughs> capacity to help Ghana on this level. So which is, shows that there is a genuine <coughs> constraint in giving this kind of advice. Um, the cooperation in uh, the cooperating institutions are all major oil and gas and financial institutions and there are the Norwegian counterparts. Next one. What have we managed to do? What we have managed to do is together with the Kenyans sit down and help to create a regulatory and legal framework restructuring the whole oil and gas industry through the Petroleum Commission Bill, the Petroleum Exploration and Production Bill, and also the Revenue Bill. If you look at the way that they do the Revenue Bill, it has certain <coughs> similarities with how Norway has dealt about how you have an oil fund for future generations which you want to build and fill in sometimes in the future, and then you have some way of helping to live with fluctuations in oil income, which Ghana is very much interested in. We have to, yeah. Yes, I'm just finishing. Capacity institution building. We have worked with the Petroleum Commission. We have worked with on the environmental side with spatial planning and capacity building. And then, next one. National content building national industries together with the Ghanaians and cooperating with civil society via Revenue Watch Institute, Asset and Trade Unions. All I, we are spending about six million dollars a year, 15 man years, in order to do this kind of thing. If you look at the result of those six million dollars a year on the global economy, on the global on the economy of Ghana, I think it has been worth it. And this is my last slide. The assessment is there is now a big assessment of the whole oil for development program and it comes out <coughs> positive and it comes out positive on Ghana. So there's an overall positive assessment of the program. Next one please. Main achievements, legal regulatory work and building confidence in the Ghanaian state to deal with a very complicated sector. The success factors, why is this a success? Why maybe could be something for others to learn? Heavy Ghana involvement and commitments, an extreme commitment from the government, from the top to the bottom, to actually try to make this a blessing. Very high level of local capacity, so in that sense Ghana might be different from the absolute tourist countries long-term commitment with significant resources from the donor, early start, and Norway using its comparative advantage as donor. So, that's what I wanted to say. I think it could be an interesting model. I know the OECD has taken a lot of interest in this kind of um, uh, exchange of information, trying to build capacity, deal with <coughs> this very difficult sector, and I think uh, this is the contribution that we have. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, it was a very long session. Uh, please uh, get your box lunch. Small lunch. Uh, we need 10 minutes to, to drink. We have a break, and after we will go back to the discussions. Uh, and I will ask perhaps the team to reply to the first question <laughs> raised, and we will open the floor. <laughs>